Hello, my name is Alex Storage and I'm an Ansible Solution Specialist. And today I'm going to be focusing on the Ansible Automation Mesh that rolled out with the Automation Platform 2.1. So what is the Ansible Automation Mesh? Why do I care about it? How does it help me perform the automation operations that I need to do? So if you've ever used the Ansible Automation Platform in the past, you understand that it used to be very rigidly coupled with the control plane. So anytime I wanted to scale out my execution capacity, I was also scaling out my ability to ma manage the role-based access controls, the API, which in terms of resource utilization was not necessarily the most efficient manner of doing so. Also, as I started looking into complex environments, I typically had to leverage something that was called isolated nodes in order to manage different geographically separated data centers or to reach DMZs that had additional security requirements to reach into from a central automation platform. So we've shifted to this concept of automation mesh, which allows you to no longer need to leverage SSH, which if you've ever tried to reach across the globe or into some more complex, challenging networking situations, you may have run into issues where just SSH wasn't capable to handle that situation. So with the automation mesh, we've added an additional network overlay that can have multiple paths to getting to an end execution node, but it will also leverage TLS authentication encryption, ACLs to ensure that I can handle my complex environment, maybe hopping multiple ways to get to the end node, while also having that layer of security on top. So this is really a way to extend out your automation outside of a single data center, whether that's on-premise in the cloud, to cover a much more complex environment. So if I start looking at this in a global manner, I may not just have a data center residing on the West Coast or just in Europe. I may have data centers all over the globe, whether they're on-premise data centers or different regions in my Azure AWS environment that I need to automate. Preferably, I want my execution to happen closest to where those particular end devices live. So I'd rather have my execution occur in Azure East rather than having it occur originating from my data center in the West Coast. So this gives me a lot more flexibility in setting this up. And if you notice, many of these different execution nodes have multiple paths to get there. So for some reason, a network connectivity to Greenland that goes down, I still have a path to get to Europe through a different mesh protocol that's been set up. So it gives me a lot more flexibility in any sort of scenario that may arise based on the complex nature of networking and the complex nature of managing multiple data centers around the world. How do I set this up? How do I get this off and running? So the creation of your automation mesh is all done through the installer inventory. So there are different groups just like you're used to with the previous iterations of the automation platform, but now we've added in a section called execution nodes. So I can set this up however many that I want and I can peer them together. So if you notice there is a peers variable in that execution node section. So this tells you how different nodes talk to each other. So I can set up my automation controller just to be a control node or to be a hybrid node. So it gives you that flexibility where it only runs controls or it also has the execution capability. I can create what we call hop nodes, which only provide a transport protocol layer without the actual ability to execute code. And then I can also have my execution nodes, which are then that end location where those playbooks actually run. So I've got full flexibility in setting this up. I can create as many peers as I want so I can fully set out and define exactly what my mesh looks like. So I know however my network connectivity may lie, I've got a mesh that matches that complexity. I also have the capability to use what we call an instance container group. So if I wanna have expandable execution at runtime, I can also link my automation platform into OpenShift to leverage that capability. So I can use a bearer token that I've set up for OpenShift with the appropriate permissions. In this case, I've actually created a separate namespace that I want to leverage, and it provides that capability to run execution inside my OpenShift platform. So now I can take advantage of a VM-based solution for the actual setup of the control plane, but leverage my execution in a scalable environment. 
So I can have a little bit more flexibility for maybe critical playbooks that are running such as a critical patching job. Maybe I want that scalable execution of a container platform. I can leverage that by leveraging container groups. So where can I assign these mesh nodes, these instance groups that I've created? So three different places that I can assign them. I can assign them at the organization level. So if you've created a security organization or a cloud organization, maybe I want them to give them that single execution node that lives in the cloud to execute their playbooks. Or I've got an inventory that's been set up to only handle a specific security zone. I can assign at that level or an individual job template, such as that patching example I just talked about. I can have a critical patching job that has a single instance group assigned to it, and you can create a preference list of that. So maybe I have four or five different instance groups that I've created. I can order them within that inventory or job template, and it will go through that list based on what's available. This is an order of precedence. So anything said at the job template will override everything else. Anything at the inventory level will override what the organization level is set. And then organization is that base level. So we've kind of talked about what mesh is and what it can provide. Let's look a little bit at the automation platform to see where these pieces actually rise and how I can take advantage of them. So as you can see, I'm logged into the automation platform now. In this case, I'm going to specifically focus on that mesh capability. So if you've seen the automation platform in the past, there is still that instance group section of the administration. So this is exactly as you saw before, if you were leveraging isolated nodes, but now we'll actually be leveraging those mesh execution nodes instead. So I've got some instance groups that were automatically set up with the control plane, which are my control hosts, and then the default instance group, which in this case contained all of my nodes. And then I've created a mesh and open shift for the container group. So I'm gonna dive into this mesh instance group and I've added in a single node. So this is a rel eight node that's not part of my uh, control host. And we do also have this capability that they've added in to do health checks so I can verify that this host actually is reachable. So in this case, I'm actually going to run that health check. So I'm just gonna check the box, click health check. It will perform that particular health check and let me know that, yep, everything's actually up and running. I can leverage that for execution capacity. I can easily turn off or turn on that instance. So any jobs to get assigned to this particular instance group would either leverage or not leverage that instance group. So very easy to add in or remove nodes based on what my environment is. So I could have an instance group for each data center, each security zone, I can set up as many or as few as I need to. And then as we also talked about, I can also create container groups. In this case, I'm leveraging my OpenShift environment. I've already created a bearer token uh, inside my environment with the appropriate permissions. In this case, I've also created a separate namespace for Ansible to leverage when it's running playbooks inside OpenShift. So as we talked about, I can assign that it, this at different levels, whether the organization, the inventory, or the job template level. So I'm going to look at an inventory that I have today for Azure. And when I'm actually editing that inventory, I have the capability to assign instance groups. As I talked about, you can assign multiple instance groups. So if there is a order of preference, maybe I want this to run in my OpenShift environment first. If that doesn't work, then run on the mesh and then default back to my control plane. So I can rearrange this based on what my priorities are, but now I've got full control over where the execution of this playbook runs, or I can just say, I want this to only run inside OpenShift and select that. This is also carried forward within the actual job run. So I can look at a previous job run to see what the results were of that particular playbook. So if I previously run a job, like I just did to view my mesh status, I can go into the details and see what the execution node was for that particular job run. This also shows me based on that mesh capability, I ran a playbook that is essentially checking to see what the status of my mesh is. So it actually can get a nice JSON out, but as you can see to show, here are actual all the known connectivity. So when I talked about that peering capability, I can actually see that in action where in this case, my rel eight nodes can reach both tower and tower, tower my both my servers. However, the rel eight server can't communicate back to those on initiation. So it kind of shows what the different routes are to reach different places. So it's an easy way to see from point one to point two, how it would get there. In this case, it's also set up what was the route that was used to get to that particular host and it can walk through that process. So in this case, I'm running this on that rel eight host and I can see a cost of one to reach there. So you can get much more complex if you change some of the settings, but there's a great and easy way to set up multiple paths to the end system. 
So I've also got set up here, I've got a patching job that's set up. As you can see, I've got an OpenShift instance group and I've also added in a default one. So I do have OpenShift running in my environment today. And there's that Ansible project and namespace that I talked about before. Currently nothing is running in here, but I'm actually gonna launch this job through my patching job. I don't want to exclude anything. So this job is going to launch as part of that job execution because I have that bearer token set up. It will actually spin up that container inside my OpenShift environment, perform the full process of actually running my playbook. And then at the end of the day, that will destroy that container. So it's a full automated process. I'm essentially just leveraging OpenShift for the execution of this particular playbook. And this takes advantage of all of the capabilities of the execution environment that I've created. So while I didn't define the execution environment in that container group, it is leveraging the execution environment that I've assigned for this particular job template, whether again, that's set at the organization level, the inventory level, or at the individual job template level. But this is going to run through completion and I can see it is actually updating that playbook as we go through this to handle the full process of this case, patching all of my Red Enterprise Linux servers. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility when I look at, maybe I don't know what my capacity is going to be or how many total nodes I may be automating against, but I want that capability to run in a scalable environment without having to create a large cluster of Ansible VMs to be able to manage it. This is a way to extend out your automation. So if you want to learn more about what is this capability of automation mesh, how does this integrate in with the Ansible Automation Platform 2.1, there are several blogs that walk through that. So all of the new features, including execution environments and that automation mesh, then a full blog that talks through what is automation mesh, how does it replace that isolated node capability. And then there's even a browser-based training course that walks through automation mesh so you can see that capability inside your own automation controller and take advantage of that. Thank you for taking the time out and hopefully this helps give it a better idea of how Automation Mesh integrates in with the Ansible Automation Platform 2.1.